Yeah, I, mean, I don't know how I've actually uh, survived so long in video games. I really didn't intend to get into video games at all. This is what the theme of this lecture is going to be about. It's all completely accidental. I, I, I really just... Uh, well, I'll show you what happened. Uh, this is where I went to school. It's uh, just a very ordinary school in Basingstoke in the UK. Um, nothing particularly special about it. Um, most schools back then, I, mean, I, I think I started going there in 1973, I think. Do you no idea how old I am? Um, and they had no computers at all, um, no connection to any remote computer. So there was absolutely none, you know, the, the, no computing on the curriculum whatsoever. And then at the end of, of, uh, of secondary school, you, for your last two years before university, you go to a place called a, a sixth form college. And this is where I went in Basingstoke. And um, basically you do two years of work there and take your uh, three, well, up to, well, as many exams as you can take, but normally it's two or three. Uh, A-level exams, which uh, then precede your entry into university. And when I was there, my, the things that uh, I'd been best at in school ended up being maths, physics and English. Now, those are kind of weird, because back then you had a very sharp divide between like, your science and engineering stuff, where the maths and physics was, and your creative arts, where the English was. And not many people sort of straddled the line like that, so it was a bit, I was considered a bit weird for my subject choice there, but they just happened to be the things that I was best at. You also had uh, what was called a main study, which uh, actually was no such thing. It was like a, well, you, know, you had your three exam subjects and then they made you do effectively one more subject as a filler and called it a main study for whatever reason. And uh, I was offered the chance to do computing. So I thought, I mean, I didn't really know much about computers at that point. I really thought computers were just things like this, with boring people in suits, in offices, tending to boring machines. But I thought the subject is eminently skivable. Now, skiving, I don't know if you'd have the term over here, but skiving basically means uh, going away from school when you shouldn't and hanging out downtown and uh, basically skipping school. But I think if it's such a boring subject, I could skive it, what the hell. So I went to my first lesson and they were going to teach us this language called Cecil. Which, um, what does it stand for? Computer Education in Schools Instructional Language. Now, actually, it wasn't too bad of a language looking back. It was kind of assembler-like. So, uh, given my later uh, experience, it could have actually been quite useful to learn it, but it had a big problem. The UI was really bad. That was the UI. So, you didn't actually type on a keyboard or anything. You actually wrote stuff in pencil on this form, and then you'd send it off, and then a week later, you would get back the result, you know, a printout showing what happened. It was extremely boring. And so I thought, I really don't want to do that. And so I carried on skiving. And I didn't think, as far as I was concerned, that was the end of computers and me. One of the popular skiving activities when you went off down Basingstoke were uh, going to Woolworths, <coughs> and you go upstairs in Woolworths, all the Pong machines are up there. Going to the Chippy, we had a breakout machine. Best of all, go to the record shop, and they had Space Invaders, and that was fantastic. But I mean, these were things that I never actually thought of as being anything that I could do. I mean, I thought they were just machines that people built somewhere, elves made them or something. <laughs> it, it wasn't something that I thought you know, an individual like me could actually sit down and do. But then one day I was in, in college and wandering about and I went into the wrong room and I saw a guy sitting in front of what looked like a, a weird typewriter with a weird television on top. And uh, it turned out it was a guy called Richard Rawlinson, who became one of my best mates as you'll see. And he was playing a game on that. And I was like, you know, A, what is this thing? And B, how come you're playing a game on it? And so I asked him and he said, and he said, I typed it in. 
And at that point, my life changed completely because I thought, if you can actually type things into a machine like that and make games, I really want to know how to do that. So I immediately went to the library and got a book on BASIC. My brother was doing a job with the AIA at the time and had a, a, a Texas Instruments TI-59 calculator with a printing cradle, just like that. And it came with um, a list of pro a, a book full of programs. And so I basically took a biorhythm program that was written for the calculator and I ported it to BASIC, even though I'd never actually done any programming before or even written any BASIC before. But I worked really hard that night. I think my parents were amazed to think I was doing, doing my homework so diligently. <laughs> and the next day in the early morning, I went to school, typed it in, didn't work. But then Rupp, Ruptured Rawlinson, arrived and um, he started to help me out because basically he'd had a, a research machine 380Z in his school and knew quite a lot more than I did, so he was kind of my guru when I was in my learning days. And after that, this was my shrine every day. I worshipped at that flashing green cursor. <laughs> I'd come in early in the morning, I'd go home late, last, no, last person out of school at night. My parents couldn't believe it because I'd never exactly been that keen to go to school. And then here I was like, getting up and getting into school at half past seven in the morning. I think I thought I'd gone insane. Uh, there ended up being like just five people in the whole, the whole school who actually were into this stuff and kind of knew, you know, knew about it. There's Rupp, Mole, Clovis, Jono and me. And we'd all write games for each other. And at one point, it got, um, we'd start, we started writing each other's high scores on the walls. And we got into a bit of trouble for that, not to, not to wipe them off. But we were the only nerds in town at that point. And I spent many happy uh, early mornings and late nights learning the ways of the pet. We didn't have a lot of documentation with it. So we had to disc uh, do a lot, you know, basically discover a lot of it by experimentation. Know, poking in weird locations and seeing what happens and crashing the machine <laughs> and writing games of BASIC, which was okay, but after a while you start to find BASIC a bit too slow for more ambitious games. You want more stuff moving around on the screen and BASIC simply couldn't do that. So Ruptured Rawlinson told me about this thing called machine language and I'd never heard of that, but he explained what it was and this became my new bible the 6502 instruction set. I studied that extremely diligently. And people would think, I'd be sat there in my English lessons. I was still supposed to be doing maths, physics, and English when all this was going on, but really I didn't care what I was about then. So I, you know, I was sitting in my English class making notes, and everybody would have thought, oh, yes, look at him, he's being very diligent making notes, but my notes would be things like this. <laughs> <laughs> but where, yeah, holy cow, when you actually start to run Machine language, it was like a couple of orders of magnitude quicker than basic. I mean, literally like a thousand times faster. It was absolutely insane. And I was like, wow, this is incredible. I need to do more of this. And yes, yeah, so stuff that had taken you know, a couple of seconds, a loop that had taken a couple of seconds to complete would be instantaneous in, in uh, machine language. It was fantastic. At first, I just used to use a little bit of memory in the cassette buffer to add routines to speed up basic. But uh, eventually, I started to do stuff in 100% machine code, which was quite an undertaking, especially when you, know, you didn't have a disk drive or anything. You had to, had to, do, had to uh, uh, load and save everything onto cassette tape. And you only had half an hour slots at a time anyway, so it was quite hairy. But basically, that was me finished with high-level languages for about 16 years. I did everything in assembler from there onwards. Now, this, this actually is is a... Is, uh, a resurrection of uh, one of my games that I actually wrote when I was in sixth form college, recovered from a 38-year-old cassette tape. And I hadn't actually seen this for, well, 38 years. And uh, this is, I'm, I'm playing it quite badly there because uh, there's something up with the emulation, the keypad doesn't quite work right, so the controls were a bit off. But I hadn't seen this for 38 years, so there you go. <laughs> that was me, age 17. <laughs> doing machine code on the pet. But what I found was that coding was the perfect bridge which straddled those two areas which had before had seemed to have a brick wall between them. I mean, coding, you, you know, it's, it's science-y enough, it's maths-y enough, but it's also incredibly creative. You can actually 
write whatever you want. I always say that being a coder is the modern equivalent of being a wizard because you can like speak the words of power and make things come into existence. I'd found my perfect subject, and I wanted you know I wanted to spend all my time doing this. And so uh, yeah, after a while, only more than the teachers did at Sixth Form College. So I asked to transfer off of one of my other exam uh, courses onto computing. And I thought it would be a logical thing to do, but they said no. You can't do that because the, the years started and they didn't think I'd be able to catch up to, the, to do my A-levels. <coughs> I was gutted. I was genuinely gutted. I really, really wanted to just get an A-level in computing and go to university and do computing there. So school life went on. I kind of went on with the other subjects that I had to do, even though all I was really interested in was computing. But you know, so all my real effort went towards coding on the Commodore PET. Every spare moment I was in there. In fact, one time a teacher actually punished me by banishing me from the computer room for a week. It's the worst punishment I could possibly imagine. <laughs> but there was still time for more skiving. And we used to go to this, uh, there was a shop in Basingstoke called Computer Time. And remember, this is a time when everybody thought digital watches were still a really neat idea. So there was this, this shop which sold like, video games and digital watches. And they also sold computers. Like the CompuKit UK 101, I lusted after this because I, I was so into computing that I really, really, really wanted a computer of my own. But I mean, back then, it was super expensive, that was the trouble. I mean, even the CompuKit UK 101 was like 250 quid. The, Comm the Commodore PET, which I learned on in school, was, was uh, I think about 800 quid. And for a school kid, it's just like, no way. But then, a miracle happened. This guy came into my life. Look at his smiling face. <laughs> and brought out the Sinclair ZX80. This is just towards the end of my sixth form time. And I, I got a job after school. Um, I was cleaning uh, offices and toilets and saving up. And I managed to order a 1K ZX80 in the spring of 1979. And at the end of my school days, in summer of 1979 or so, I received two things in the post on the same day. One of them would have a, quite an effect on my future career. I got my exam results, and it wasn't them. <laughs> it was this. Oh, I loved that little thing. I loved it so much. <laughs> and the rest of that summer, I bought a knackered old telly off a, a, a granny in Reading for a fiver. I, mean, it, it was, I think it was still dual standard, like 405, 9 and 625, and full of valves to go just to warm up, but you could just about display the ZX80 on it. I spent every waking moment programming on that thing. I mean, even though you only had 1K, it was like you could still, it was your own computer that you could program at home. Nobody could kick you off after half an hour. <laughs> I expanded it to 4K, one, two, double, one, four at a time, because that's all I could afford. <laughs> that's half a K at a time. Uh, I even sub submitted a program to uh, Practical Computing Magazine, and they actually published it. There it is, with uh, my name on it. And as a result of that, I got the first money I ever earned in, co in computing. They paid me five quid for the publication of that, uh, of that program. And I, I, I found the receipt the other, the other day. I was going through some stuff and I found I still had the receipt for it. Well, after that, I went on to university and unfortunately for me, this was a short chapter. Basically, I, I went, again, I, was, I went on the strength of my exam results, which weren't that strong in the first place. And it was still all supposed to be maths and physics. And yeah, I tried to get into university on a computing course, but nobody had me because I didn't have the A-level exam, you see. So when I was at university, I didn't really apply myself to maths and physics at all. I spent all my time messing about on the, on the computers at campus. I nearly got thrown out for hacking once. I mean, we, did, we weren't doing anything, anything malicious, but we, we were just like basically breaking out of the uh, student shell and into the uh, like operator's shell and giving ourselves extra computer time, that kind of stuff. We got caught in the end. And so at the end of the year, I finally did get thrown out because my results weren't, weren't good enough, really, on the, in the subjects I was supposed to be doing, even though I was still learning more and more about computing. I asked to transfer to a computer course when they were throwing me out. I said, yeah, come on, generally, guys, I really think I could catch up the first year without a problem. 
no, I said, no, we cannot bend the rules for you. I was gutted again. I was determined to get in somehow and study computing. Plus, my parents weren't best pleased with me getting, kick, getting kicked out of university. So I got a place at Oxford Polytechnic. Now, uh, Polytechnic is like university, but a bit slightly more rubbish. <laughs> so I was able to get in there. And it was still maths and physics, because I still didn't have any qualifications in computing. But they said at the end of the first year, I could transfer over and finally start to study computing. I thought, thank God for that, I'm going to get in. So started the autumn of 1981. And it's quite a long commute every day. I didn't have a car or anything. I was, I was going like, I think it was like eight miles on a bicycle to the train station, then another couple of miles on a bicycle at the other end, up a very steep hill, and then back, back home again, the same means at the end of the day. But this man was at it again. There he is, look at him. <laughs> look at that beard. What a magnificent beard that is, looming over me like that. Fantastic. But, he was doing such a service for us, Uncle Clive. The ZX81 came out. It was cheaper and better than the ZX80. It was unbelievable when I first saw that. I thought, I have to have one. And the thing with the ZX81 is that it sort of started to push uh, like home computers out of like nerd territory into more general territory. Kids were starting to get these things, and you know, ordinary people were starting to buy them, which uh, had never happened before. It had always been extreme nerds like us. And uh, there started to be these events called ZX microfairs that were fantastic. And you'd go there and it was just like nerd heaven. <laughs> and there'd be a, and that, yeah, that's the first place I ever saw sort of software houses, people actually writing software and selling it for the ZX81. I thought, hey, that's, that's fantastic. And then I went there um, as a punter one day and uh, showed one of the exhibitors some, some of the stuff I'd made on the ZX81. And they gave me a 16K RAM pack. I couldn't believe it. I mean, I, there's no way I could afford a 16K RAM pack. They gave me one and said, if I, if, I, if I could develop some more games, then they could sell them and I'd get money for them. I was like, what? Get paid for making games? Amazing. <laughs> Hell yes. And so one of the things I made for them was this uh, uh, game called Centipede. It's, although it's called Centipede, I'd never actually played the, uh, the arcade game at the time I did this. I just kind of... I'd heard how the arcade games were supposed to operate, and I kind of just made it up, uh, you know, tried to do the same thing myself without, without ever actually having seen it. So as you'll see, it doesn't really look that much like the, like the arcade game. The laser base at the bottom only goes left and right. It should go up and down as well if it's going to be properly like, like the arcade game. But, but this, this actually was the occasion of my first moment of nerdy fame, because this, this came out and actually got quite reasonably well reviewed amazing though that must seem that looking at it um, and one time I was queuing up outside one of these ZX microfairs waiting to go in and I heard the lads in front of me in the queue talking about which games they're playing and one of them was saying oh I've been playing a lot of Centipede at the moment and I said to him oh what you mean do you mean Centipede by DK Tronics because they're the ones who published it and he said yeah 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 I really like it and I said oh I, I made that he said you must be Jeff Minter I'm like whoa <laughs> somebody knew my name couldn't believe it <laughs> Basically, I was doing all this stuff for DKtronics, and I was commuting to the Polytechnic every day. And yeah, I used to travel to Great Yarmouth as well on weekends because that was that's where DKtronics were based. So I'd go down there to liaise with them, and it all got a bit too much, and I ended up getting quite seriously ill. And also, I found out that another company. Remarkably enough, called KD instead of DK, um, happened to be selling all the same stuff that I'd made for DK Tronics, and it turns out this KD Electronics was um, a DK Tronics cousin or something like that. Um, was basically just selling my stuff, bootlegging it, and changing. You know, they, they sold a copy of Centipede, but they just hacked my name out. <laughs> So I thought, okay, I really don't, don't want to be dealing with KD or DKtronics again, so I was rather dischuffed about that. So I was out of higher education again, still not studying computing. The people who publishing my ZX81 stuff turned out to be dodgy. And I was ill. Fantastic. However, 
I did get one of these. <laughs> and that, that made me so happy. I loved those things. And it, uh, the, the thing with the VIC-20, it was very similar in architecture to the, uh, the PET on which I'd first learned. Plus it had a proper keyboard, so I know it's not very British of me to abandon Sinclair and go to, and go, and go to the VIC-20, but I did. It was so nice. And so programming was something I could do lying down, so I could do it when I was reco while I was recovering from my illness, which took several months. Uh, I bought some games for the VIC-20 and they were terrible, really, really bad. So I thought, yeah, if people are selling really, really bad games for like seven quid, why don't I think about doing it myself? And I doodled this little thing out one day. I don't, I, I've always had a fascination for camelids, so I was just doodling, draw a, drew a llama, and then underneath, just put llama soft. Because uh, my, you know, I could do better games, or at least games which are not quite as bad as the ones that I'd actually seen on sale. <coughs> Wouldn't have to deal with them dodgy geezers in Great Yarmouth. And I could do it myself. And I had nothing to lose at that point. I would tried everything else. I'd honestly tried my hardest to get into the educational system and study computing, but at every stage, I managed to screw it up. So there I was. And so we started Lamasoft in March 1982. Um, we made a few little VIC-20 games initially. I sold my own version of that centipede game. And we gradually built up. Our packaging wasn't exactly the fanciest back then, but I mean, it was distinctive, who remembered it. Eye searing orange. And uh, one of the first games I made was this uh, incredibly clunky Defender clone. I mean, everybody did this stupid thing of like calling it Defender with an A instead of Defender with an ER, because that would make it all right with copyright. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. <laughs> but I mean, that, that would, uh, some of the spellings of Galaxians I saw, you, know, you used to see back then, were remarkable in their contortions. But you know, this was the, the, those were the days of clones. It was kind of expected of software houses that you would just copy arcade machines. And this was really quite crappy, as you can see, the ships the size of a bus, the scrolling's jerky. And it's, it's pretty ugly. <laughs> oh, pause. Uh, so we showed that off at uh, Commodore Show and Hammersmith. It's sort of, like there was a, they were the Commodore equivalents of the ZX microphones. And we sold out of tapes. It was amazing. And, uh, and a nice American guy in a suit came around and, uh, and asked me if I could do a cartridge version. And I said, well, yeah, I can, even though I didn't really know how. But I thought, I'll find out how if you want a cartridge version. And that eventually was sold in, in the US as Aggressor by Human Engineered Software. And they said they had much nicer packaging than us. And I was talking about it was the era of clones. But uh, Atari started getting heavy about it because Atari owned the rights to like, most of the really popular arcade games back then. And they were saying, you know, if you do these games, even if you spell the name differently, we will come and get you. So I changed Defender to Andy's Attack and instead of human ones, they're little llamas, they're little llamas. They're not going to get me now, are they? And, uh, yeah, I thought then, yeah, I, w I wanted to do a centipede style game, so I'd, I'd done that centipede on the ZX81, and it was a bit rubbish, because it didn't actually behave like a proper centipede. And uh, what was nice about this was that uh, I decided to start adding my own stuff, rather than just like cloning centipede, I thought, why not, why not add my own bits and pieces to it? Uh, the US guys really seemed to enjoy it when I sent it out there, and I remember getting a phone call at like 3 o'clock in the morning from them saying, you really like this game, stand by, you're probably going to make some serious money from it. I was like, oh, that sounds good. <laughs> but meanwhile, <laughs> that man again. <laughs> Look at that smiling face, he looks so happy. I mean, we loved this guy. I mean, he, was, he was every British kid's Uncle Clive. Because uh, he'd given, he'd given the, their best toy ever, basically, the Spectrum. I mean, although I was a Commodore guy, I, I, I really respect the Spectrum for... Uh, for, for what it did for the UK software industry. I mean, a lot of, lot of people who ended up going into the industry started out with the Spectrum. It was quite hard to get you know, decent games out of the Spectrum, so some very good programmers emerged from that scene. And even the Queen loved him and uh, made him Sir Uncle Clive. So yeah, he was pretty much school kids hero. Everybody loved Uncle Clive. And September 82, this beast came out. And uh, 
my US distributor was, uh, came over to a computer show in London and brought one over for me. And some months earlier, I'd been in, in a shop playing around with the Atari VCS and I'd seen this, this game, it's uh, based on the Empire Strikes Back. You have a little ship which has to fly along and shoot those, uh, uh, the, the, the walkers. And uh, I saw a review of this game and they mentioned giant mechanical camels. And I thought, hello, that sounds good. So I ended up coming up with this. My first Commodore 64 game was this. It's a bit, you'll see it's a bit, bit clunky, a bit rough. But I was like, it was the first thing I did on the Commodore 64. I remember on the American version, uh, there's a bug which makes the camel's bums drop off sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> But it was distinctive. People remembered this stupid camel. <laughs> the thing is, I actually really love camels. I, mean, I was notorious for liking camels when I was in, I was in school. I don't know why I like them so much, just because they look weird. I, mean, I love wildebeest as well. You know? <laughs> I like odd-looking animals, I suppose. So I thought, let's have a game where the camels are, uh, are the heroes instead of being killed. So I made up a, a, a ridiculous backstory about how the, the camels in Attack of the Mutant Camels had been like, brainwashed by aliens that had abducted them and then they sent some new camels in to, 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 to liberate them, and hence the revenge of the mutant camels. It's all complete nonsense, but, but this one became quite popular on the Commodore 64. And quite a lot of people started to remember, or started to, 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 to see these weird games full of weird beasties. This game had 42 levels, which for its time was quite a lot. And it wasn't a clone of anything. I realised I was having more fun doing my own thing than I ever did trying to copy Atari's arcade games. And then there was Hover Bobber. This was another favourite of mine. This was designed by, by me and my dad. Um, uh, we did it together. One morning we were staying in this nice sort of country mansion near one of the computer shows in, in, um, in Bur Birmingham, I think it was. And one morning we were sitting there having a very nice breakfast and we looked out and the groundsman was going around mowing the lawn. And me and my dad started like, tossing ideas about it. So, yeah, you could make a game about that. So, yeah, you could perhaps you know, steal your neighbour's mow and he's trying to get it back. And like, yeah, perhaps you could have a dog that you could set on the neighbour. And it's, it's a few sort of small ideas which fit together really nicely. And it's kind of a, a, a typically British comedic game. It went down very well. And then we finally got a, a, a good artist, and uh, this was uh, my sheep game of the, of the day. But uh, we hooked up with this artist called Stein Arlund, who did fantastic airbrushed artwork. He's done some brilliant stuff for us over the years. <coughs> finally. And the thing about the 8-bit days is that, uh, because uh, I, 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 it was just small teams, it wasn't sort of super duper commercial, um, everything was fun, everything was experimental, everybody was trying all kinds of new stuff. When they used to have a rating in, in, in computer magazines for originality, you never see that anymore these days, do you? And this was uh, towards the end of my Commodore 64 career, it's a game called Iridis Alpha with like, two spaceships that scroll in different directions. And this one was quite nice actually, I really enjoyed this. Although I, I really messed up the difficulty curve. Level 3 should be about level 20. <laughs> but I just really enjoyed the creative freedom of the 8-bit era. It was, it was tremendous fun. It was really, really good times. I even did, did some stuff uh, which, which weren't, weren't well, things which weren't games at all. One of the things I've, I, I, I'd always had an idea for was the thing called the light synthesizer. When I was 11 years old, I used to lie in a dark room and listen to Pink Floyd, and when I did, I would hear, see like shapes in my head. The, the sort of weird abstract music would conjure up these weird abstract shapes in my head, and I always thought one day I'd like to have a machine that would let me externalise those shapes. And after I'd been working with uh, computers for a while, I thought, why don't I try to do some work myself in that direction using computers? And so the first thing I did was this psychedelia. It was just a 1K little algorithm which produced these flowing colours and the idea was you'd put on some music and play with this and just enjoy yourself, make yourself a little light show. 
And then the, there's a version for the 8-bit Atari, which is even nicer because you had a much much better color palette on there. And you, you could do the display list stuff on the Atari was really nice. You could make these like curved screen effects and interlace effects, which uh, looked far, uh, much prettier than the Commodore. And then there was the dawning of a new era. These two new machines were on the horizon, and we all looked forward to them very much, the Commodore Amiga and the Atari ST. Uh, they would be rivals in pretty much the same way that the uh, Commodore 64 and the Spectrum were rivals in the UK. And they were both American-made machines, but you know, we loved our Uncle Clive. And we thought, come on, our Uncle Clive surely is going to come out with a 16-bit machine that's going to kick the ass of those two. The Queen and Country, come on Uncle Clive. <laughs> Bugger. <laughs> the QL came out and it was rubbish. But I got an ST and continued my light synth experimentation. I had a lot more flexibility now with a 68K processor. I could draw more dots and with the mouse you could draw curves. And I got somebody to do some pretty background artwork for me. These glowing heads and stuff. It was a lot of fun. And um, the most complex uh, light synth I did was a thing called Tripatron, which took a year to make. It had its own programming language. Uh, it was like a, a parallel programming language. You could run up to eight threads at once, had its own editor. Um, you could do offline animation with it. Uh, I had a performance rig, which was five Atari STs uh, mixed through a custom built video mixer, and did a couple of like. Uh, 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 well, Ars Electronica festivals and stuff like that. And I used to do light shows at, the, at all the exhibitions we went to. I had a projector sc projection screen. I used to do like Pink Floyd shows. Great fun. But the games business was changing. Uh, you got larger dev teams, bigger companies, stuff costs much more to develop, and smaller outfits like Lama Soft were finding it really harder to achieve any kind of distribution. Uh, advertising in magazines were getting much more expensive. And so I decided to try a new idea that I'd heard about from the US. <laughs> so this is, this is, let me see if I can turn it down on here. No, it won't actually do it. Unfortunately, it seems to be tied to the HDMI. Oh well. Never mind. Carry on. So yeah, this this game was uh, distributed on on the cover disc of a computer magazine, and it was done on the basis of basically, if you like the game, send us a fiver. And um, also, it, it it was pure shareware which you don't often see these days. Pure share, basically, you, you gave the whole game away and you just asked people to pay only if they liked it. And we got an astounding response from it. I can't remember how many thousand people, it was about 70,000 quid we made on that game, I think. Something like that. And it helped popularize the concept of shareware in the UK. And it was amazing, because so, I mean, some people even sent us more money because they thought the game was worth more than five quid. And loads of people just wrote letters to us saying how cool it was that we'd give them a, a game and trust them to pay. It was fantastic, really heartwarming stuff. And uh, it, it helped keep Lamasoft going through some pretty lean years. And I say the industry continued to change. Game consoles came out and they really changed everything quite seriously. The old system started dying away. And a lot of game dev moved over to consoles, much larger teams, much more expensive stuff. And we thought, hey, maybe, maybe there'll be a British console. Maybe, come on Uncle Clive, you know you can do it. For Queen, for country, come on. <coughs> Bugger. <laughs> oh well. But there you go, I look just as daft. This is me in, in the uh, supposedly movable chair of a, a, a British console that never came out, actually a Welsh console. <coughs> Conix multi-system. I, I was doing a version of like Attack of the Mutant Camels. You didn't even need that stupid gun that I'm holding there. <laughs> also, look at my bloody perm. <laughs> so yeah, the world's first Wel Welsh console. They ran out of money. Never released. But I did find 
just recently somebody actually uh, wrote an emulator for the Conix multi-system and actually found my game or found an early version of my game I, th I thought I'd never see it again so yeah it was it was quite a nice little system really but they just ran out of money I had procedural music generation going on in this actually something I must return to I quite enjoyed that And I also did some work on the Atari Falcon. I did a game called Llama's App for Atari. I started to develop a bit of a relationship with Atari because uh, I'd done some stuff on the ST after, after Llamatron. I think they really started to notice me when I did Llamatron. And so I did a game called Llama's App for them on the Atari Falcon, which was fun. And I was invited to work on the, on the Atari Panther, which was really quite a tasty machine. We had a very good sound chip. It was basically a 2D machine, though. It was kind of designed as a competitor to the SNES. Um, and I, need, I'd be, I did some demos on it, but I only had it about a month, and they, they pulled the plug and said, no, they're not going to release it, give it back. And I was invited out to the US to play with the prototype of the, of the, of the Jaguar. I was actually shut in a little secret room, I was given the documentation and they said make something and so I made this. this is, these are the actual demos that I did when I was cooped up in that room jet lagged to hell <laughs> um, and seeing this machine for the first time in my life I didn't realise they'd actually saved the demos and somebody had uh, put a video of them out onto YouTube. I was astonished to find that those things were there. And, uh, it was great because at one point I, I, this, this stuff was running and, and Jack Trammell came round and he, he, he watched this for a little while and he, he turned to one of the other engineers and said this is the best stuff I've seen on the Jaguar so far I was like whoa hey get in <laughs> so yeah the, the Jaguar was certainly a lot of fun anyway that, that goes, it's worth looking those up actually on YouTube if you fancy it because they're, they're, they're quite interesting I ended up doing this for them I love the music in this game. Yeah, the, the guy who's the main system architect of the Jaguar hated the early demo that I sent out. He said, Atari were only going to release it as a make-weight game. It, it, they really didn't care for it. It didn't push the Jaguar at all. He was like, this is rubbish. Basically told him like, that Tempest 2000 was rubbish and was never going to go anywhere. It ended up being rather well liked, so yes. And uh, anyway, shortly after I did Tempest, T uh, Tempest 2000, uh, this game Tempest X3 came out. And it was obviously Tempest 2000 with some slight changes. And when it came out, I was like, why, yeah, why, why did they change it? Because the, the changes they made sort of made it a bit more bland and um, took the edge off it. And although the graphics were a bit nicer, it really didn't play as well as the original Tempest 2000, and I, I wondered why, why they'd done that, and why do they call it Tempest X3 and not Tempest 2000, given that Tempest 2000 had, had glowing reviews everywhere. Years later I found out, because I, I, I chatted to the programmer online, uh, uh, there are many more Playstations out there than Jaguars, because the Playstation was a much more popular system, uh, and the original agreement I had with Atari was that Llamasoft would get royalties on any ports, so this port was made based on the Tempest 2000 source code, but the program was instructed to make slight changes to the game, and the reason for the changes was to reduce the royalty burden. So, yeah, let's just recap this. The, the Atari, I've made the, one of the best games on their system, and the way they reward me is to make a deal to cut me out of any royalties. Nice. I did the, uh, some work on the Jaguar CD-ROM. I uh, carried on with my light, light synth experiment. You can see why, we, see why we called it the toilet. It looks like a little toilet, <laughs> it does. <laughs> should say Toto across the top, shouldn't it? And we proposed an audio reactive light synth for that, which this became. It was the first uh, uh, music reacting thing which I'd done. Everything else before I'd done in the light synth way had been uh, uh, done by hand and it was uh, made by I did the graphics work uh, the audio analysis code was done by a friend of mine from from Inmos who'd been sent out to the US to help with a new startup now it's quite funny because um, well it's not funny um, he'd been sent out to the US to uh, buy Inmos to help out with a new startup he said they're about 10 guys there 
he was the only one who was moaning, he was the only one who was sent out there who didn't have shares in the company. Everybody else had been given shares. Um, I actually went out to see, to, to visit his office one day, and it was just like a very small place in Silicon Valley. There were about sort of five or six people in there when I was there. And they didn't even have any hardware yet, they hadn't designed any silicon yet. The name of that company was uh, NVIDIA. So yeah, I bet he's a bit pissed off that he didn't get any, any uh, shares in that. Anyway, in 1994, despite all this business with Atari and, uh, and Tempest X, I uh, actually moved to the US to work for Atari, because you know, I do like Atari. I mean, I, I, I don't, Atari meant video games when I was growing up, so the idea that I could work for Atari was really quite seductive, so I moved over to the US. And like, in that building, I was actually working with the same people who designed that Commodore PET, which, which uh, I'd, I'd learned on so many years ago in sixth form college, and I couldn't believe I was actually sitting there working with these guys as equals. It was like, wow. And I did uh, Defender 2000 on there, which was one of the last games. Uh, unfortunately, what I found was because I was an employee, they wanted to push my game in directions I would never have taken it if I'd been doing it on my own. Like, the first one they told me it wanted to, they wanted it to be a CD-ROM game. They wanted to have, like, giant sprites in it. And I was like, no, it's Defender. It needs to be small and delicate and psychedelic and things need to blow apart. We're like, no, we need big sprites and parallax backgrounds. And, uh, I, I ended up doing the best I could, but it's not the game I wanted to make. And there are still people to this day who will kick my head in over this game and tell me I should never be allowed to do another Defender game ever, which I think is a bit sad. But anyway, it didn't last long. Atari died in 1996. And uh, basically, the Jag wasn't good enough to comp compete with the PlayStation. They didn't have enough good software. The engineers who were working on the Jaguar II at the time, who I knew pretty well, actually one of them, one of them was the same guy who who'd slagged off uh, Tempest 2000 a few years previous. But we ended up being good mates at the end of the day. And they proposed setting up a new company. And I was also at the time being head headhunted by Activision. But I didn't really fancy going to live in LA and, and Activision, I mean, I suppose they were different then than they are now, but I'm, I'm kind of glad I didn't end up there, to be honest. Um, I, I always, always would rather follow my heart when it comes to where I want to where, where I, where I work as opposed to following the money. So I went with the guys who set up VM Labs and they made this thing called the Nuon, which was a very interesting chip. It was designed as a, 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 a more versatile DVD decoder chip. Back then, the DVD decoder chips were, were hardware, and we thought we'd make one which basically ran DVD decoder software, and then it could be repurposed for other stuff like playing games. It was a 54 megahertz CPU. It had, well, I can explain about the parallelism if anybody's interested, come up and talk to me about it. But it was, yeah, it was architecturally very interesting, and for a nerdy assembler programmer like me, it was kind of heaven. Um, but unfortunately for them, um, most games programmers aren't really in it for the programming. They're in it to like, write, get stuff developed quickly, and so they want high-level languages in C and not an extremely obscure assembly language which only about eight people in the world ever fully mastered. But I did do a light synth for them that was built into these DVD players, but the, the, they never took off. I did a, a Tempest version for them, which is all right, but it hasn't got the resolution and frame rate that I would have preferred because they took away about two and a half of my processors. I think only 11 games were ever made for the system. It was just too hard for people to, to, to code on. And so they ended in 2000. They were a year late to market as well, which didn't help. And very, very limited uptake. You can find, you can find the players on, on eBay, but they're quite rare. They didn't get the support they needed from content makers and basically that was the end of my time in the US. Came home, moved back to Wales. And uh, I started doing some stuff. I thought, well, yeah, what shall I do? And there were these things called pocket PCs back then. I don't know if you ever remember them. But they were kind of quite fun. These little handheld, colored devices. And I did a few games on them, but uh, they really, you know, they weren't that commercially uh, uh, successful because there just weren't enough of these devices around. But I guess the world wasn't quite ready for gaming on small handheld devices. I was a few years too early, I think. And then in 2003, out of the blue, I got contacted by Jay Allard out of Microsoft. I was like, bloody hell. And um, apparently he'd seen the visualizer stuff we, that, we, that we'd done and liked it and asked us if he wanted to do visualization stuff for the Xbox 360. And we thought, hell yes. 
And at that point, uh, Ivan Zorzin joined, uh, joined Armsoft, who's a, a very talented programmer and looks after the engine side of things to this, to, to this day. And he created the Neon engine, which actually is the basis of everything that, we, that, that, that we've done ever since. That engine has been evolving along with us. So yeah, built into the Xbox 360. Definitely you know, the widest distribution of Llamasoft code that there's ever been. No royalties though. Uh. And in 2007 I did a space giraffe for the uh, Xbox Live Arcade, which was uh, kind of tempesty, but not fully tempesty. And it was like extremely trippy. Uh, the trippiness was actually part of the of the game's difficulty, and it was extremely divisive. Like, there's one guy from the official Xbox magazine who said, like, <coughs> gave it two out of ten, and said it was like a failed art project and horrible, and disgusting. And then there's like people like Jonathan Jonathan Blow, the guy who made Braid, maintains that Space Giraffe is the best thing ever released on the Xbox 360. So you had this like divide. You had half the people over there and half the people over there. But I figure it's 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 nice to make something that provokes a strong reaction. Yeah, even a negative reaction. If you provoke a strong reaction either way, it's better than just having something that's in the middle of the road and blah, you know, everybody forgets. And in 2009, I did uh, Grid Runner Revolution. But this was planned for Xbox Live Arcade, but then like, there was a changing of the guard at Microsoft, and we were no, no longer welcome there, and so we released it on Steam instead. Oh, there it is. There's lots of fluffy sheepies in it. <laughs> and then I spent two years trying, bashing my head against the wall, doing iOS games, um, which I really enjoyed. I mean, iOS is tremendous fun to code on. It's uh, very capable hardware. Um, these were fun little projects, you know, so I spent like a month here and two months there and made lots of fun little games. I'd never made a platform game in my life before I, I did iOS and so I was doing, did all kinds of different stuff. And I really enjoyed myself, but unfortunately it just didn't make any bloody money. You know, short, small projects, fun to do, but, so you might as well play lottery on iOS a lot of the time. <laughs> Terrible visibility unless you're in the top ten and the people who are, in the, who are in the top ten already are fighting tooth and nail to stay there and spending lots of money to stay there. Good. I mean, all, all my games got fantastic reviews, all the user reviews were fantastic, but didn't make any difference. People expect support forever, I still get moaned at for the fact that I'm, I'm, I'm not maintaining this game that somebody bought sort of five years ago for 69p. <laughs> and these days people expect games for free anyway. Anyway, so I moved on from there and then Sony came to the rescue and wanted, they wanted more games for the Vita. And they started encouraging indies to come onto their platforms and uh, invite us to make a game and we made TXK, because I, I thought it'd be nice to revisit Tempest 2000. If, I, if people like that game, but when I look at it, I see all the flaws, I see the low frame rate, I see the low resolution, and how it doesn't really look like a vector game. And on the Vita, with that beautiful OLED screen it had, you could make a really beautiful version. So I made TXK, which did pretty well on the Vita, actually. And as a result of that, we were invited to play with early prototypes of the PSVR. Um, I've always enjoyed working with prototypes. You know, I'm happiest when somebody gives you some unreleased hardware and tells me to do some funky stuff on it. I love that. And so I did a game called Minotaur Rescue VR, which was um, a game without a controller. You were like inside a sphere, and there was a little ship, like an asteroid spaceship, and you basically controlled it just by looking where you wanted the thing to go. It actually worked, worked pretty well. Um, I did a, a port of TXK to VR, which was fantastic. Uh, we also did TXK ports to PS4, PS3, PC, Android, PSVR and Oculus. So we're thinking, yeah, come on, we're going to come out with uh, TXK on all those things. And then, bloody Atari. <laughs> Completely different set of people now. Now, now Atari is just, a, Atari is just a, a bunch of lawyers who, who, who own some names. And they accuse me of stealing my source code from myself. <laughs> and, uh, they threatened us, I mean, they didn't actually sue, but I figured it, I couldn't really release the ports under, those, uh, under that, that kind of threat because there's no way I could defend myself against them. Ended up doing Polybius, which came out earlier on this year, which is a very trippy, psychedelic uh, 
uh, a PSVR game. Well, you can play it outside of, of, of PSVR as well. Uh, much to my astonishment, uh, Trent Reznor out of Nine Inch Nails contacted me, told me he'd love playing the game, really liked my work, and would I create a special version for a music video. And they ended up making a, um, a music video for their track Less Than, that's basically an advert for Polybius. It's fantastic. <laughs> And that's the story so far, really. Oh, well, apart from one, one last thing, uh, um, I've kind of uh, decided that uh, it's better to work together with Atari than it is to fight, and at least by uh, releasing this, uh, our, one of our, some of our TXK ports as Tempest 4000, we can get them out there. So this should be hopefully coming out at the end of this year. But yeah, it's enough Tempest. I'm, I'm done with Tempest after this. It's been quite a journey. I mean, from it's like you know, going from the ZX80 to the to the PS3. I was like going from an ox cart to the Starship Enterprise, and, and it feels really weird to actually encompass all that in 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 one career and one head. <laughs> it's not over yet. Still carrying on. Still very much enjoying the journey. I'm going to carry on until they plant me. I think. And yeah, I have a few words of advice to people just starting out on their own. Just, you know, study game history. You've got fantastic resource in, in emulation, you've got MAME, you've got stuff like Game Base, consider that your library. Go through those things, look at, you know, study the classics, try and understand what makes them so good. Uh, study the ones in particular which are still good to this day, and there are a few of them around. Study Robotron. Robotron is just fantastic. Yeah, exactly, that's just what I'm saying. Yeah, and consider making a clone. I mean, you know, Look at a, a great classic, which is uh, brilliant, and, and try and implement your own version of it. Maybe extend it a little way. I mean, help yourself to the ideas that are in these things. This is stuff which is all there to be, to be plundered. And so this, the stuff you learn from those old games will still apply in many ways to modern game design, so it's well worth doing. Start with small projects. Don't try and bite off things, you know, too, bite, bite off uh, too much for you to chew because there's less chance of running out of momentum. The thing about, um, about uh, games is that you've got you've to complete them. Get them finished and released. Because completion is one of the most valuable skills you can learn. I know so many people who've got, you know, started a game idea and then dropped it, and started another game idea and then dropped it, and they've got all these half-finished games and never put anything out there. If you just like pursue one to the end, finish it, get it out there, get it onto whatever distribution means you can and you know, get some feedback from it. And the more you do that, the more confident you'll get as a game designer. It's well worth doing. Develop a signature style. This is something which I tried to do you know, from the earliest days of Llamasoft. Well, um, it, I, wanted, always wanted, I wanted it to always be that if somebody looked at a screenshot of a game, they could say instantly, that's a Llamasoft game. And, uh, Visibility is always an issue, so if you make your games distinctive, then whenever they come up, people will catch a glimpse and say, yeah, I know who did that one. So many games look great, but you can't tell who made them. You know, if you put a screenshot up, you couldn't say who that, whose game that was. I want people to always recognise, yeah, that, that's a Llamasoft game. Uh, but you need to evolve your own style as well. Don't stagnate and always do the same thing, but, you know, iteratively change things, move forward, but keep it your own. Don't stress over your own limitations. I mean, everybody's got their own limitations. If you can't draw, try doing some geometric procedural, procedural art style. Same thing can apply to music. I've done procedural music before now. I mean, a lot of, there's a lot of old games had all kinds of constraints forced on them by the hardware, but they were still brilliant games. So don't worry if there are certain things you can't do work within the constraints, it's, it's a good exercise. You can still make good games. <coughs> work your design around the constraints. Uh, sometimes it's good exercise just to you know, decide, I'm going to make a game with only one button, or I'm going to make a game where you can only go up, or whatever. Yeah, sometimes it's fun to work against, against constraints. Take advantage of the modern tools. You've got fantastic stuff these days, like Unity and Unreal. And uh, it's so easy for people to get into game design now. You don't have to be there's some kind of assembly coding wizard to, uh, to, to, to join in. So yeah, use that stuff. It gives you uh, cross-platform uh, stuff as well, which is brilliant. There's no need to reinvent the wheel. Lots of people have trodden this rope, route before you. Um, you know, learn and borrow from their wisdom. 
but China has to be too, too generic. Uh, consider recruiting a, a, a biz marketing guy, because if you're like me, I don't know, as, as a game designer, I'm not really that interested in business, and I think if there was one thing I wish Lamasoft had, it would be some kind of biz dev guy, because I really haven't got the head for that, but it's a necessary evil, and it's something which I think everybody really needs, so when you start setting up a team, look out for having some kind of biz dev guy. Find somebody who enjoys it, <coughs> allow you to concentrate on the actual game development, but keep an eye out for yourself, because as my, I learned with Atari, business makes people do strange things, and sometimes you think that, you know, oh, surely I've, I've done fantastic stuff for this company, surely they're not going to turn around and stab me in the back, and then that's exactly what they'll do. So be careful, money and business make people do strange things, so keep an eye out for yourself. There we are. And make the games you want to play. That's all I've ever done, really, is make the games I really want to play. There's no better motivation than really wanting that game to exist. You put passion into it, you'll put love into it at that point. And the moment that you realise that you're sitting there playing your game, you know, last thing at night, you're sitting there playing your game and just loving every minute of it, then you know it's going to be a good game at that point. You know you've done it. Enjoy the work, but enjoy other people's work as well. Have a look around, see what your fellow indies are doing, check it all out. It's all, it's all great, and it's a, there's a lovely, vibrant, creative community out there. Looking back, I mean, life's been just an endless chain of projects. I, don't, I haven't really, I've never stopped. I've never stopped programming since sixth form college. I can measure my life in projects instead of years. It's, it's good. Um, I've never been particularly rich. I've been, I've, there was a time when I was quite well off, a few times when I've been quite poor, but I've always been fine, you know, and these days I'm doing okay. But what I can say is I live in a lovely place, doing work that I absolutely enjoy, I genuinely love, and that I've never worked on anything that I didn't love. Um, I think there's not many people in their career can say that. So I hope your careers will be as long and as happy as mine has been so far, and uh, I wish you all the best of luck. Thank you. Thank you.